Welcome, Dr. Rowat. Hey, hi, Robert. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Glad you're here. Good to see you. So everyone, this is uh, Dr. Yogesh Rowat. He is uh, one of the faculty members of the CRCV. And uh, he'll have more to say to you, I'm sure, about other things. But today he will be doing uh, an introduction to deep learning. Uh, an overview. And um, I think I'm going to uh, head out for the time being. Um, but I'm going to make you the host of the meeting if that's okay with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. 
That sounds good. So we're going to record today's presentation for the students. And otherwise, I will plan on seeing you on Thursday for the project presentations. OK, great. OK, thank you. All right, thank you. See you. Good hands. I will see you soon. All right, so uh, just give me a minute. Let me share my screen. Okay, so are you able to see my screen? Uh, yes, and I can see the laser pointer as well. All right, great. Thank you for confirming. Now let me stop sharing and let's do a quick intro. So as uh, Robert said, uh, I'm Yogesh Rawat. I'm a faculty here at CRCV. And I have been here uh, for the past three, four years, around four years. And this will be, I think, my third year uh, working for this RU program. And so why don't we uh, do a quick intro, your name, uh, then like from which university you are coming, a little bit of background, and why exactly you want to participate in this RU program. All right, so why don't we can just follow the numbers actually I'm seeing uh, probably those are your student IDs. We can start from one. So Lee, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, yeah, so uh, you want to introduce yourself? Oh yeah, sure. So my name is Lee Miao and uh, I'm from University of Minnesota. I'm a computer science major, or like junior or senior year, somewhere between that. And yeah, I did some introduction to machine learning stuff, but it's not related to computer vision or some keras and TensorFlow stuff we've been using. So this concept is still kind of new to me. Yeah, I'm looking for learning more about this material. All right, great, thank you. So who is number two? Uh, Tess? Uh... Yeah, so I'm Tess. Um, I'm from College of the Holy Cross in Massachusetts, and I'm gonna be going into my fourth year. And um, I haven't really taken any classes with machine learning or any of that. I did take an introductory computer vision course at school. So that's kind of why I was interested in this RU and I'm interested in learning more about um, machine learning and stuff like that. All right. So who is next, uh, Robert? Yeah, probably you can just unmute and start introducing. You don't have to wait for me. Yeah, uh, name is Robert Lake. I'm from University of Virginia, computer science major going into fourth year. Um, I was interested in like this RU program and computer vision in general, like I haven't taken any classes in it, but like I'm at the point where, like in school where like I should have like some idea, like something more specific. I want to narrow down my focus on and I really like it. I'm very really interested in the topic. All right, that's good. So this is a really a great topic to focus on at this time, at least for I think a decade. So you made the right choice. Okay, so who's next? Uh, that will be me. Uh, hello, I'm Tanja, and I'm currently going to my third year of uh, computer science and music at Wisconsin Madison. Uh, this is my first experience with anything machine learning or deep learning related. Um, but so far I've been enjoying it and I'm excited to learn more, especially because that's kind of what I want to specialize in uh, as my career goes forward, I guess. Okay, great. So you said uh, that's pronounced as uh, Tonji? Yeah. yeah, your audio, uh, sorry, I couldn't hear you. There was a break. Uh, like Sun, Jen? Sanjay, okay. On. Sanjay, okay. All right, great. So, who's next? Um, my name is Chu. Uh, I go to the University of Arizona, and um, 
last semester I worked with a professor at my university on a um, statistical machine learning research project. And mm -hmm. I found that really interesting. So I wanted to um, get some experience in computer vision this summer. All right, great. So who's next? That, that would be me. Okay, um, my name is Zane. Uh, I, I'm from Illinois Institute of Technology. I'm majoring in artificial intelligence. Uh, I'm interested that the only reason I like machine learning and artificial intelligence is because of computer vision. So I, so, um, I got to know about this program from the previous ACM, uh, ACM uh, pre president of uh, IIT. Uh, she she recommended me to this program, and mm -hmm. so far I've liked it. Thank okay, you. that's good. So we are getting, uh, I think, uh, students from IIT. I think consistent consistently from last three years. So last year, if you knew Arushi was there. Yeah, she's the one that actually uh, told me about it. It's like we were in the Discord. I asked about research opportunities. She came yeah. to me with this. I applied and. And then there was Eric before before yeah, her. She told me. So I, I still talk to Eric sometimes. He's working, but he's not happy. So he's applying for higher studies. <laughs> and Arushi, she, she's still working with me. I actually met her uh, yesterday. She's yeah. preparing a submission for NeurIPS, which is like the top ranked conference in machine learning. And I think she also got a PhD uh, admit from, I think Penn State. So she will be starting this fall. So that's really exciting. All right, so who's next? Uh, that would be me. Hi, my name's Leah. I actually go to the University of Central Florida. So right here, I'm going into my third year though I'm I'm like kind of behind on the computer science because I was originally computer engineering so I'm not like super far into things yet. So I haven't taken any computer vision or machine learning classes but I've always been super interested in stuff like that so I, uh, someone sent this opportunity in one of the like it was actually also the ACM from our school. So I was like I was like oh my gosh well I have to apply to this so now I'm here. <laughs> okay great. So your background is it like animated because I really like it. Yeah, it's a it? it's a video I found it on found it on YouTube. It was like it was like Minecraft virtual Zoom background. I'm like I like it because the because the cat actually moves. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> so yeah, I think Brian is next. Uh, I'm Brian. Uh, I go um, to UCF. I'm currently going into my fourth year as a computer engineering major. Um, I also haven't really had any experience with machine learning. But it's always something that's um, really interest, interested me for a while. Um, and I heard about this program from the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at UCF. Mm -hmm. I thought it was like a perfect opportunity to learn more and see if it was something I'd be interested in. So I applied. And so far, I'm, I'm learning a lot. And it's been pretty great so far. OK, great. Right. So let's start yeah. Uh, hello, I'm Ethan. I'm a student at the uh, at UCF uh, Honors College. I'm going into my third year. I'm a computer engineering major. And like this is the first like formal like experience I've had with AI. I've done a couple of projects in the past, but they were just kind of like with clubs or I don't know, there was kind of like more like hobby things. But this is like the first like formal exposure I've had to it. And it's uh, it's really cool. <laughs> Okay, that's good to know. Hey, hey Dr. Rawat. Hey, hi, Michael. Yeah. How are you? I'm good. Um, I had your class last semester. Yeah, I remember you. Yeah. So um, I uh, was looking for um, research experience, and someone mentioned Dr. Uh, Shaw. And so I, I got on a, a Zoom meeting with him um, last year or sometime. Uh, he suggested the REU, and uh, so here I am. Okay, great. So that's really good. Thank you for uh, the nice introduction, uh, all of you. So now today, uh, we are going to do, uh, do like a, a brief introduction in deep learning, and we'll try to cover different things. And I will go uh, 
very slowly because I'm not sure like what kind of background you have. It might be very uh, wearing. So please stop me uh, wherever you want uh, want to. If you have any questions, you want to clear some doubt. So don't hesitate. All right. And so now let me share my screen again. Okay, so I hope this is uh, visible now. Okay, so let's uh, briefly uh, cover uh, what is like uh, on the agenda today. So we'll talk about convolutional neural networks and we will see like how uh, they are widely used in like all kinds of applications. So you might be hearing this like in the news articles everywhere, like deep learning is doing, the, doing this, doing that. So most of the times uh, it's a convolutional neural network which is actually being used. And we will talk about like how uh, they can be used to solve actually different type of problems. And then uh, what we'll do is we'll do a, a small case study on this LXNet architecture, which was kind of a kind of a first network which uh, which provided this a breakthrough in 2012, and then like all of this uh, deep learning boom started. And we'll talk about like this LXNet architecture, although it started in 2012, but this was nothing new. This ar architecture was sitting there, I think, uh, way back in uh, late 1990s. And the only change was uh, we had like more powerful GPUs, more powerful machines, and the most important, we had more data. So all of those factors actually come into play. And then this uh, existing architecture was used, which actually uh, changed how uh, research was being done at that time. Then we will briefly cover like how uh, we perform training, how these networks actually learn. And then if time permits, uh, then we will briefly talk about this uh, recurrent neural networks uh, where we have sequential data. All right. So convolutional neural network, uh, they are just like a class of neural network and neural network is like a very, very uh, general architecture. And CNN is like just a one type of uh, architecture which falls under this category. So the special uh, things about CNN, uh, it usually takes an image as input and it doesn't have to be an image, it could be anything else as well. But most of the times you will see that you have an image as input and then you have the CNN, which you call like your deep network or your, your neural network or your uh, model. You can, so these all are like uh, names uh, you can use for the same thing. So you have that model and then it will take that image as input and make some predictions, all right? So that's the whole process. And the predictions could be anything we'll see like depending upon the problem, which problem you're trying to solve, it will make different kind of uh, predictions. So the very, very basic kind of problem uh, which is uh, usually solved using CNNs is image classification. All right, and the figure here, uh, which I'm showing you, this is like a very basic structure of, uh, of a traditional CNN. All right, so we'll go through like uh, each of these components of what these are, and let me know if you have any questions, any, any doubts here. So starting from here, this is like your full model or the CNN architecture, all right? And this is the input image. So this input image right now, it's just showing an RGB image. So RGB image, it's a colored image. It will have three channels and each channel will be like, you can represent that as a matrix, okay? So if you think about this, then this is kind of a volume and the shape of that volume will be depending upon what's the resolution of this image. So let's say the resolution is uh, 500 cross 500. So it means that it has 500 pixels uh, in this direction, 500 pixels in this direction, all right? And each pixel will have a value and the, that value will be between zero and 255, all right? So then you can uh, save uh, that in a matrix and that matrix could be just 500 cross 500 uh, table kind of thing, all right? And then you have three different such channels, each for like R, G, and B. So then this volume is 500 cross 500 cross three, and these are that many numbers. So that will be your input to this CNN architecture, all right? Now uh, we'll briefly uh, cover like what these components are and later we will talk about like uh, how they work. So if you don't understand about anything about like how uh, this network is working, don't worry about it. So this is just an overview. 
So in a CNN, we usually have uh, some convolution layers, all right? So then we have some kind of uh, non-linearity. All right, we'll talk about what non-linearity is. We'll also talk about uh, how to define or how this convolution layer works. And so for now, just uh, try to remember these terms. So these are like convolution layers which will take this image as input, which is again a volume. And then these convolution layers actually take this volume and produce another kind of volume, which is kind of a transformation where you are learning the features, all right? So then what's happening is in this network, you are actually transforming volumes to volumes. And at the end, what you do is you take the volume and you just like flat it. So for example, uh, the volume at this level is let's say 28 cross 28 cross 512, all right? So it could be anything. It's just a random number I picked. Then what you do is you just pick all the numbers in that volume and put that as a vector, like a single line. And that's called feature flattening. So you will get like just one row of those values. All right. And so this kind of architecture is called fully connected layers, or you also call this like a multi layer per perceptron MLPs. All right. So then these, uh, these are different from uh, this convolution layers. And what happens here is like each neuron, so we call these neurons are connected with all the other neurons. Right. So, and again, this is a kind of a transformation. We are going to talk about that as well. And then at the end, uh, we actually try to make predictions for each class, which you want to detect in this input image. So in this case, for example, we have four different classes, uh, birds and said dog and cat. So what we will do is we will try to figure out whether bird is present in this image or not, whether sunset is happening or not. And then at the end, this network will provide you four different values and each value will tell you whether that's, that particular class is actually present or not. So if the, and these values are ideally between zero and one. So if it's close to one, you say that, okay, that, that category is present. If it's close to zero, you say that that category is not present. Right? So this is a very, very general notion of how your uh, CNN works. And don't worry about how these layers are working, how the CNN layers are working, but uh, you should uh, get the idea behind like what are the different components. So any question in that, uh, just let me know now. Okay. All right, so I'm assuming uh, there is no doubt. So now, as I said, uh, that AlexNet architecture uh, was, was proposed in 2012, right? And it was not the architecture which made the difference. It was like the other factors the computation power, the data. So this is almost similar architecture and it was proposed in 1998. All right, so these are the authors and you might already know all of these authors because they often come like in the headlines. And so back then it was used, so it was called Linet architecture and it was used to classify black and white images, of course, because RGB again, mean if you have more data, you need more memory and these were like very small resolution, 32 cross 32. All right, so 32 rows rows and 32 columns. And each pixel will tell you like uh, the gray level, which could be between zero and 255. So that was the input. And again, this is like image, but single channel. And then you have these convolution layers. So you have like some subsampling layers, then convolution, subsampling. Subsampling is like you reduce the the resolution of these features. And we are also going to talk about uh, how this subsampling works, but the idea is like, we want to uh, reduce the memory consumption as we move forward. So usually your feature map size reduces. So this one is reducing it to half. Then you again perform some convolutions, reduce it to half using subsampling. And then these are the fully connected layers of which we were talking about in the last slide. And then the final layer where you have the prediction. So you have 10 different predictions because uh, they had like 10 different uh, classes for these uh, uh, letters. And they also use this for like a digit data set where you have 10 different classes, okay? Now, this is like a traditional system where you have this uh, fully connected layer, but these days, uh, these layers are actually not required. You can directly end at uh, the CNN layers and make the predictions. So again, that's a variation, but uh, just to let you know, so don't worry about that if you don't see any fully connected layers in your architecture. 
Okay, so as I said, like this LXNet, and again, you can see this, this has like almost similar structure as this. And this was like in 2012, uh, this is the structure and this is the figure from the original paper. I didn't create this. And you can see that uh, half of it is actually not present. This was a mistake, I think, from their part. So what actually it's doing is you have this input image and the resolution they used is 224 uh, by 224. And uh, I, I think it was 227 by 227. Again, this is a typo. And three channels like uh, for R, G, and B. So you can see like you have two different uh, branches here. The first, the lower branch and the top branch. Right, and these are almost identical. They did that to actually distribute the learning in multiple GPUs. So this part of the network was trained in one GPU and the top one was another GPU. But otherwise it's like similar. These days we don't need that kind of uh, dividing. So these are all the convolution layers. You have these uh, max pooling layers, uh, which is similar to like subsampling, which we talked about in the previous slide, where you reduce the shape of your convolution uh, volumes or the feature volumes. All right, and then you have these fully connected layers. So this number 2048 is saying like that many neurons are present in this layer. And again, 2048 neurons. And this is the final prediction layer. So they used this architecture on ImageNet uh, data set, which is like a large scale data set for image classification where we have thousand different classes. And that's why they predict thousand different values. Okay, so this was winner. Uh, of this challenge, this challenge actually used to run every year. So this was, I think, fifth or sixth installment for this one. And the good thing was uh, the error rate actually was 15.4% and the second best entry was 26. So this 10% jump was a huge deal because prior to this, the improvement was a couple of points, like 1% or 2% every year. And this year it was like a drastic, drastic change. So now that, that was a very, very brief overview of how CNN works. And now, now let's talk about uh, what are the different uh, problem domains where we can use uh, those CNNs, right? So the most popular is classification. And classification is, it's, it's a very general machine learning problem where you have some data sample. It could be image, it could be, it could be video, it could be text, it could be anything. Okay, so you have an input sample and you have like then certain set of classes and your task is to actually classify that input into one of those classes. So that's called classification, very general problem. So in this case, I'm showing you, this could be object classification, all right? And, and, and we also use like a recognition in, uh, instead of classification, both recognition and classification are like the same thing, all right? So, and this specific slide is just showing you classification of images and it's telling you what's happening in the image. So again, so that's a variation of uh, image classification. So you can see like in the, in the bottom of the image, these are all the classes we have. And the first one is like what the network predicts. So this is a very, very basic problem uh, which can be solved using uh, CNNs. Okay, so now the next problem is object detection. And this is uh, more challenging than image classification or object classification. Uh, the reason is in object detection, uh, you not only have to classify like which object is present, you also have to locate uh, in the image or it could be a video as well. So that will be video object detection. So you'll have to locate like where exactly that object is present in the image. All right, so if you look at the sample, you can see that uh, if you have to just classify which objects are present, you will just say uh, car is present, dog is present, horse is present, person is present. So that will be classification. All right, so just those uh, four numbers. But if it's detection, you have to localize it. You'll have to maybe draw this kind of bounding box, which tells uh, you the location. Or you could actually just uh, fill in all the pixels, which are car or which are dogs. So that's like uh, more advanced, I will come to that. That's called segment, uh, segmentation. So if you're doing this bonding boxes, all you need is like maybe the X, Y coordinate and the height and width of this bonding box. So instead of, the, uh, the, instead of the classification score, you also have to predict these four numbers, which can be used to localize that object, okay? So that's object detection. And then if you want to uh, move further, we can have semantic segmentation 
which is even more challenging. So what we have to do here is we have to tell each pixel which category this pixel belongs to. All right, so that's called semantic segmentation. And you can see here that uh, these are like the ground truth annotations. These are different methods used to solve this problem. You can see that uh, if this is a cow, so the orange color is for cow and all the pixels which are marked as orange are actually part of this cow, right? So this gray one is for a uh, sky and this green is for the grass. So that's called semantic segmentation. Again, you can use CNNs to solve this problem as well. Now, other uh, interesting problems. So as I said, uh, it, it doesn't always have to be images. CNNs can be used for other data modalities or maybe to solve problems where you have like other modalities like text. And one such problem is image captioning. So image captioning is given an image, can you describe what's happening in that image? So for example, in this case, if I'm showing you this image, then the answer should be something like a person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road. So this is called image captioning and you can use CNN actually to solve this problem. You show this image to a CNN and then it will generate that textual uh, description of that image. Okay. So in the bottom, uh, you can see here that I'm just uh, referring to the papers which have used CNN to solve this kind of problem. And you can see that most of these are like pretty old 2015. So like these days we have more advanced techniques to actually solve this much better than what used to be there in 2015. But again, I mean, they are based all based on our CNNs. Okay, so another interesting application is style transfer. And if you are into arts, then this will be really exciting for you. And the problem here is given an input image and a target style, can you transfer this uh, style into this input image? Right. So this is a natural photograph and I asked the network to actually transfer the style from this image to this one and that's the output. So you can see that this is like uh, the same image, but the style has been copied from this one. Okay, so these are some other samples. So uh, it's not just images. NLP is like a very uh, active research area, like a very important research area actually, which is like classifying text or that's the basic problem. So we can use CNNs to actually solve problems in NLP as well. We can use them for audio research, all right, for speech recognition. So the idea is as long as you can transform your input data into matrix format, you can use CNNs, all right? So that's the bottom line. And so this one is showing here that uh, how if you have a sentence like this, I love NLP and like dogs, you can transform this into a matrix where for each word, you come up with a vector. And when you stack like these vectors together, then it's going to be a matrix, which you can pass to your CNN. All right, and the, this vector, you can get like there are existing techniques for that. So we don't have to go into specifics. So word to vector is one such uh, technique. And same for audio, like you can actually uh, get the spectrogram for the, uh, input audio, and this can be treated as an image and passed to a CNN. So it's all about converting data to 2D matrix format. And again, if it's 2D matrix, it means that you're using uh, 2D CNNs, but we have different variants there as well. We can have 1D CNNs, we can have 3D CNNs. So 1D CNNs are used uh, for audio signals, EG signals, so all the signals which have just one dimension. So if you don't want to convert the uh, audio signal into spectrograms, you can directly use 1D convolution on this input directly. And similar like for videos, um, it has an extra dimension of time, right? So you have image at every time. So it's kind of a 3D volume. So for that, we need 3D convolutions. So these are like all the uh, variations of uh, CNN. Then the next interesting question is, do we have like perfect CNNs? Can this solve all the problems? And the answer is of course, no. But this is something interesting, which uh, I'm going to show you. We can easily fool these uh, CNNs. So for example, uh, you can see here that uh, I can make, like just uh, pass some random noise to your input, uh, to your model, which you have trained, which actually works pretty well. Then it will make errors. So these are like all the classified classes. So the network thinks this is a cheetah. 
right? So all these other examples, but we can easily see that means this is just random noise. So it's very easy to fool them. And this is again a very active research area where we try to develop like these robust models, which are uh, which are actually uh, not fooled by uh, such type of inputs, right? So these are some other examples where we can fool the network. So if we just pass this image to a train model, it will easily identify that as electric guitar. So this is a peacock. And you can see that I mean, these are not just random images. These are like very carefully uh, created images. You can see that the pattern from the peacock, it's actually being repeated here, right? And the reason could be when your network is uh, where, when your network was trained to detect peacock, it was just picking up on this particular pattern. So whenever it sees this pattern, it might be detecting peacock, right? So then what we did is, I mean, we can just replicate this patch all over the image and still the network says it's peacock. So which kind of shows us uh, like the limitation of uh, these networks, right? It's not looking at the full picture. So it's just picking on cues, taking shortcuts, and that's where like this research is headed, how we can actually make these networks to make predictions like we human do. Okay, so yeah, that was uh, all the background I had to cover. Now let uh, we will uh, dive into uh, CNN, the, uh, the more details. So before we do that, uh, do we have any question? Um, yes, how are those like adversarial images generated? So these uh, vary. So this is, I think uh, there's some insertion like, uh, insertion like uh, from some of the pattern from the actual images on over the uh, random noise, right? So you are kind of patching the random noise with uh, those features, which is actually being able to fool the network. And these are just like the patterns taken from the real images and do some like distortions to them. Right, so you're just repeating those. And there are many advanced uh, ways as well uh, where you can actually, you can learn those perturbations and which is kind of more interesting as well. So I will give you one example where uh, what we do is we take the image and we, we play around with the model. We understand how that network is making the inference, how that is being trained. And then we can insert like very small noise. We call that perturbation. We call that adversarial attack into the image. And then what happens is we, as a human, when you will look at that image, you will see, okay, that looks like, let's say if it's, a, if it's an image of a peacock, you will see it's a peacock. But then because of that perturbation, which actually is based on how your network learned, it will, it will uh, classify that image to a different category, which you want it. And you might have seen like a very, very uh, famous example where, where if, you, if you have a stop sign, then if you are working in autonomous driving, right? So then if you have a, a self-driven car, then it should detect that stop sign and stop, right? But then if you perturb that stop sign image, then you can make it maybe something else because of that small change in the image. So that is like the current, I think, uh, research direction where it's heading. So did that answer your question? I believe so, yes, that's, that's really neat. Okay. So any, any other question? Okay, so if not, then uh, let's, uh, let's go to the next part. Uh, now, Neural network, like before CNNs, uh, they were just fully connected layers. And as I said, one component of a network is fully connected layers, like which is right at the end. And this uh, is used to be called as neural network. And, but again, CNNs are also a type of neural networks. This is just a terminology. So when we are talking about fully connected layers, what this means is you will have a flattened layer, right? And we call these like neurons. So there is no like shape, shape. There's no shape in this. It's just flattened feature vector. And the number of neurons will tell you like how many parameters you, you are going to learn. So these fully connected layers, they are called fully connected because each neuron is actually connected to the neuron in the next layer, right? So you can see that repeating pattern. And the idea here is, 
when you're computing value for this neuron, you actually take a linear combination of all the neurons in the previous layer. So it's kind of weighting all these values. So then for getting the value of this neuron, you will need three different weights, one for this neuron, one for this neuron, and one for this neuron. And the value will be this weight multiplies multiplied by this number. Then you will add that to this weight multiplied by this number, this weight multiplied by this number. So it's just a linear combination using those weights. And that's how like all these neurons will get their values. And then you think about this, like how many parameters or those weights you need. It's just multiplication of these two terms. All right. So that's how a fully connected layer uh, works. And this is like neural network. So the issue with fully connected uh, layers is, let's say you take an input image of size 256 by 256. So that's the resolution X and Y. And if it's an RGB image, then there will be three channels. So if you compute like how many values you have in this input image, it will be roughly like this 200K. You just multiply these two and multiply with three, right? So that will be your volume. And then the issue is if you have 200 K values as input, and let's say you just have maybe 1000 neurons in the first layer. So the number of weights you require is this 200 K times this 1000. And that, that's a lot. And that's the reason why you can't use these neural networks to train like this high, uh, high resolution or high dimensional images because that will require a lot of lot of parameters, which is not feasible, which will not fit into your memory. And that's where CNN uh, comes into picture. So what happens in CNN is you don't have that many weights. And the reason is you share uh, weights across like all the locations, all right? So if you have to get value at this location, you will use the same set of weights which were used to compute value at maybe the next, uh, the next location, right? So that weight sharing, and we later we'll see like how uh, that, has, that, that that's been done, but that weight sharing is something which reduces the number of uh, parameters you need uh, in your CNNs. And the other difference is in this one, you were just going from layer to layer where each layer was flattened. In CNN, you are moving from volumes to volumes. And we will later see like how these volumes are generated. Right? And these volumes are nothing but features extracted from your input image. So your input image is also a volume. You learn some features from that volume and that will, be give, that will give you like the next set of volume. And you again apply convolution, which means you learn some features, get some more features and you keep getting features unless you get like the, the final layer, which will just predict like which object uh, was present in the image, if it's image classification or maybe something else. All right, so this operates with volume of data and uh, the weights are being shared in form of kernels. We will see like what this kernel is. You don't have to worry about uh, this right now. Okay, so the, the basic building block of uh, any CNN network is convolution operation. And we're going to talk about what convolution operation is. Okay, so, okay, so this is another interesting property. The spatial structure of image is preserved and you will see like uh, how uh, th that is being done. Now, let's try to understand what this convolution operation is. And once you have done that, then there's nothing to understand in this CNN, right? Then you will understand everything. Everything else is very simple. So let's say we have an input image, which is 32 cross 32 cross three. So 32, 32 is like height and width and it has three channels, let's say for R, G, and B, all right? So this is your input volume. Now, how convolution works is you have a filter and this filter will have certain shape. In this particular case, it's three cross three cross three, and it could be anything, okay? So that's a parameter which you can change. So let's say we have a filter of a shape three cross three cross three. Then what we do is, we apply this filter at all the locations in this input volume, all right? And when I'm saying applying a filter, we will do some operation and I will uh, briefly explain how to do that operation. That operation is actually uh, called I mean, convolution, but it, it's not exactly convolution. It's uh, you're trying to find correlation, but people call that convolution, that's fine. Convolution is a bit different. And, but it, it, it's not that different. You just have to rotate your filter and perform the same operation. So 
And this is how you convolve. You take that filter, put it like at some location in your input volume. And after performing that convolution, you will just get one number. So that will be result of that convolution, all right? And that convolution operation is nothing. It's just element-wise multiplication of all the values in this location with this filter, okay? So this is a three cross three cross three filter. When you place it at some location, then that block in this volume will also have shape three cross three cross three, right? So you have two such uh, volumes. So you just perform element-wise multiplication and just take average of all those values that will give you one number. So that's called correlation operation. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure like what's your background if you know what correlation is. So, but if there is any question like uh, how this one number is derived from uh, this location, we can actually cover it now. All right, great. So you apply this kernel at this location, you get one number. Now, instead of applying at one location, you apply the kernel at all the possible locations. All right, so then instead of one number, you will get like a set of numbers, which will have a shape similar to the input uh, volume. Okay, so in this case, uh, when I apply this uh, to the input volume, I get a uh, we call this output feature map, and we can also call it like activation map. Both are same thing. So this will have a shape of 30 cross 30 and width of one. So we'll talk about how we get 30 by 30. We'll try to understand that. But this one, because the thickness of this filter is three, the thickness of this volume is three. So you can only slide this volume like in the X, Y direction, not in the depth, right? So in, from depth, you're just getting one value. And that's why you just have a, a flattened feature map here, right? So, and this is very important as well. So in this case, your filter size is not three cross three cross three. I mean, actually it is three cross three cross three, but usually you will say the filter size is three cross three. The last three is actually implicit and it will always match with the depth of your input feature map. So if your depth of input feature map is three, this will automatically be three. But if it were like, let's say 12 or maybe something else, one, zero, two, four, then this third dimension will be automatically one, zero, two, four. All right? So your filter is just three cross three. And that's required because you will have to, you'll have to have that many values like to do that correlation right, to that multiplication. So the depth of the filter should always match with the depth of your input volume. So now this is one set of convolution operation. Uh, and this is like, in fact, just one convolution layer. That's how it works. But in real convolution layer, we don't have just one filter. We have lots of filters. Right? So earlier we talked about like weight sharing. So exactly here we are doing this weight sharing, right? You are using the same uh, filter. Uh, in this case, this filter is your weights, which you're going to learn. So the same filter is applied at all the locations, right, to find the correlation. And that's where the weight sharing is happening. In your neural network, you need like different weights for different locations. So you are not doing any weight sharing. So now, uh, as I said, uh, in real convolution layers, you will not just have one filter, you will have a lot of filters. So it will look something like this. Let's say if you have two such filters, we'll get two feature maps. Right. And the values in these two filters will be different. So these filters are something which we learn when we train our networks. Okay, so in neural networks, fully connected layer, you learn the weights which transform your neurons from one layer to another, right? Those are the weights. In CNNs, these filters are the weights. Okay, can I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Uh, so these filters, their job are, is to like extract certain features from the image, like hue, right. saturation, blurness, noise, stuff like that. Right, that's perfect. I think you are way ahead of what we are discussing. We'll come to that. Oh, so the job of the filter is to ex uh, like to do some kind of pattern matching to figure out whether this kind of feature is present in the input volume or not. And it could be anything like all those things which you mentioned. 
Okay. Yes, uh, thank you, sir. So, and so then let's say if you have, so that's, that's your one convolution layer. And let's say you have six different kernels in this convolution layer. So you will say, okay, six kernels, each kernel has, you will always uh, say shape is three cross three. You will never say three cross three cross three. So you have six uh, kernels of a shape three cross three, all right, in this convolution layer. And then if you apply this convolution layer to this input, you will get these activation maps, all right? So this is your one convolution layer. And because you're using six kernels, the depth of your activation map will be six. And the depth of input is three. That's why the third dimension is three. And how we get from 32 to 30, we will talk about that. So anything else which is not clear in this particular slide? So this is your one convolution layer. And here we are talking about like applying this convolution layer on the input. But then if you have to build your CNN, what you do is you just have chain of these convolution layers. It's just a sequence of these, right? So your input, you have your convolution layer, which has six filters. In this case, the shape of filter is five cross five. All right, and again, you can see that the depth should actually match with the third dimension, which is the case. And applying these six filters will give you activation maps, which will have depth six, because you are using six filters. And the shape will be 28 cross 28. And you can see that earlier you were getting 30 cross 30, but as you change the size of the filter, you're just getting 28 cross 28. And again, we will talk about how you go from 32 to 28. Then you can add more layers. So this is another layer in your neural network. This time you're using 16 filters of shape five cross five. And you can see the third dimension six should match the depth of the input. All right. So you have 16 filters. That's why your depth is 16. And we're going from 28 to 24. So you can see that it's kind of reducing. Okay, and that's your uh, that's your CNN mean. And now you know this, you can design any CNN you want. Now, so coming back to like what you asked, let's try to understand that how it's uh, actually extracting features. So before that, let's first try to understand uh, what convolution is. Convolution is like a very basic operation uh, coming from uh, statistics. So if you have two different functions, f and g, so let's say ft is a function and this, uh, you can see it's a very simple step function. It was zero, then quickly it uh, goes to this level and stays there, comes down, stays low. So this is a function, right? One dimensional function. And of course you can generalize this to like high dimensional space as well, but it will be hard to visualize that's why we are just looking into one dimensional uh, functions. So this is your second function on GT. So in this case, what we are doing is we are calling this a function and we are calling this as a kernel. So it doesn't matter, you can switch these two, nothing is going to change. Still your convolution operation will be just same. It's just the terminology. Okay, so one is function, one is kernel. You're applying the kernel on the function. Now, how you apply, you actually take this kernel and you put it like all the possible locations starting from the left, all right? And what you do is whenever you place this filter, you actually find the correlation or convolution between uh, these two functions. So correlation is you know that you just do element-wise multiplication, right? And just add those values. So when your kernel is at this location right here, then you can see that none of the values are actually overlapping between the kernel and the function. So whenever the kernel is one, the function is zero. The function is zero, the kernel is one. So you will always get a zero, right? So you start from left, you will always get a zero, but you can see that as a kernel is moving ahead, so right at this location, right? So then part of, there was a part like uh, where there was overlap between the kernel and the function where both were equivalent to like this value, which is one here, right? So you can see as soon as it touches the function, you start seeing this peak. So this black plot here, this triangle is actually the response function, which is the convolution which we are actually interested in, all right? So it's zero here, 
and you can see that SNS stretches started increasing and it peaks at this location because there is a perfect overlap between the kernel and the function. And when you multiply like all the values, everything is one. So you average out, it will give you, give you a one. And that's why it's at the peak and X sliding towards the right. Again, the overlap is actually decreasing. And then you can see that it's going down. So you can also try to understand this from like this uh, area under this, this function, like kind of like overlap between these two, right? So that overlap is actually determining what should be the response. So this is like the basic intuition behind a convolution or you can say correlation. So now what's the message here? The message is if your kernel is not same as your function, then your response will be pretty low, All right? So that's what was happening on the left and on the right as well. If there's a partial overlap, mean there is some overlap, they look similar, then you will get like maybe a little bit positive response. But if there is a perfect overlap, they are very similar, then you're getting a very high response, All right? So just keep this in mind, that's the intuition. And that's how your kernels will work in your convolution neural networks. And another very simple way to understand this is like you can treat this as pattern matching. If the pattern of a kernel is matching with your input function, you will get a high response, otherwise you will get a low response, as simple as that. Okay, so that's like the formal definition of how you compute correlation and that's what we are plotting here. We don't have to go into details of that, that's pretty fine. And as I said, this is like just a 1D convolution and of course, uh, when we are doing 2D convolutions, we'll have to do 2D functions, but the intuition will remain same. It's just like you're moving from, your function is moving from one dimension to two dimensions, okay? Now let's try to understand that uh, with this uh, nice example here. Now let's say this is your input image or rather like patch from your input image. And these are your pixel values. So right now it's just a binary image. So you just have zero and one, but it could be like, a grayscale image and your, then your values will be between zero and 255. So the interpretation will not change. I've just used one and zero to make it simpler. Now, let's say this is a filter, all right? Now, in this case, uh, there's one difference. You can see that your depth of your input image is just one and your depth of filter is also one. So you can extend that as well. But again, as I said, the interpretation is not going to change. We are just using 2D to make things easy. All right. So now how convolution works is you have this filter and you can see here that this is kind of a cross. All right. So let's try to apply this filter at all the possible locations. So the first possible location will be over here. So what you do is you do uh, element wise multiplication Right, so one times one, then one times zero, one times one, and then you just add those values and take the take the average. So you can do the math, you will get number four. All right, so which is kind of a high response, not a uh, very weak. And the reason is, if you look at this part, so this is kind of overlapping, right? It's not exactly the same, but there is some overlap. So let's move forward. So this, this will be the next uh, location, like possible location where you can place this filter. And again, you will do the same thing, find the correlation, do element-wise multiplication, take the average, you get a number three. So then you do that like in all the possible locations, you slide first right, then you will start from this location and this. So then what will happen is, this is a nice demo, I think I took from this website. So it's trying to place at all the possible locations. So then you can see that when whenever you have a high response, for example, four, then there is some kind of partial overlap between your kernel and your input features or your input image. But if your response is low, let's say two, then for this location, you can see I mean, the patterns are not matching that much. Okay, so then this is something how your input image will look like. This is something which your convert feature will look like. Right. So in your condition layers, this operation is going to happen. Any question on this one? Pretty simple, right? 
So that's all you need to know about CNNs. And if you understand this, then you're ready to actually train your networks. So let me give you some more uh, insight, uh, insight on this. So this is like more real world. Let's say you have this huge filter, all right? And this is like, uh, again, the matrix representation, but when you will try to visualize this, it should look something like this because all these values are very high, right? So this corresponds to this curve here, the rest of them are zero. So this kernel has this pattern. So now let's try to understand how this kernel will work when you have a input image, something like this, okay? So let's say I want to place my kernel at this particular location. All right, so that's the patch I extracted from that location. And if I convert this to like the actual matrix format, the values which we are storing, you will have numbers like this. Okay. Now this is your input patch or input location. This is your kernel. This is your convolution operation rather correlation operation, then I'm not going to do the math, but this is like what you will do and it will give the output as the 6600, which is a pretty huge number. Okay. And the reason is it's pretty huge because the patterns are kind of matching. Now let's apply that filter at this location. So the pixel representation will be something like this. Now this is your filter and this is a convolution. So any guesses like what will happen? It's going to have a very low response, if any. Right, so you will get a very uh, low response and the reason is the patterns are not matching. All right, so it's close to zero. So now what does this tell us? This tell us if you have some kernel which has some kind of pattern in it and we have that kernel in our convolution layers, then it's just trying to find out whether that particular pattern is present in your input image or input data or not, all right? Which means that all you need is some good kernels. So if you have to detect a mouse, then you need like all these patterns in your uh, in form of your kernels, right? And if you have that, then whenever your network will see like an image of this mouse, then it will be able to detect that mouse because for patterns like this, it will get a very high response. Okay. So this is like a, another visualization, which is trying to convey the same message. And in this case, what it's trying to do is, it's trying to find uh, these uh, diagonal edges, right? So when it's, a green, uh, when it's a green kernel, you can see that your kernel is like tilted towards right. So when you place that kernel all over your image, then what will happen is all the like edges which are towards right will be detected. The others will be like, uh, others will get a very uh, negative or cl close to zero response. And the red kernel is like, again, the same edge, but tilted towards the left. And you can compare like the top and bottom image. Okay. So this is also, uh, so Michael might, might rem uh, remember this. Uh, we, uh, we used to do uh, this filtering where we used to like detect edges in your input image and filtering was like one basic operation which we learned. So you might learn kernels in your CNNs which are just detecting edges as well. Okay. So it will just be the same operation. And now, so that was the basic operation, but, but of course when there is more to it, it's not that simple. And ideally what happens is you have multiple layers in your CNN right? So you feed in the input image. Let's say this is like some first couple of layers, then middle layers, then the final layers, and finally the classifier, which is like again the fully connected layer. So usually what happens is the initial layers try to learn low level features. 
And these low level features could be just edges. They could be like simple patches or maybe just colors. All right. And the reason is because your kernel is usually like maybe three cross three, five cross five or seven cross seven. And when you apply that on this input image, which is high resolution, so it's only looking at like very local areas, right? It doesn't have the knowledge of the whole picture or the whole image, right? The whole object structure. And that's why initially you're trying to learn these low level features. That's what happens in your initial layers. Your mid level layers, like, then what is happening is uh, there is a concept called receptive field. I will briefly talk about that, but not uh, in detail. So receptive field is something when you consider like uh, maybe your feature map at this location, then each pixel value in that feature map, what are all the values in your input data that were used to actually get that value? Okay, so that whole area is called receptive field. So probably I think that's a very interesting concept and you should know about that. I should probably add that uh, into my slides. Okay, so for this particular example, uh, the receptive field for, so this is the output, right? So the receptive field for this particular pixel is exactly this. Let me go back. Exactly the yellow region. So that's the receptive area. And the reason is because we used all these values to actually calculate this. Okay? So if you're just going from one layer to another, it's pretty simple. The receptive field is exactly like the shape, uh, the size of a filter. But as you go deeper, then if you think about this, your receptive field is actually growing. Because, okay, let me go. All right. Because let's say this uh, top left value, right? The receptive field will be this region, right? Now, so that's the that's receptive field in this intermediate feature level. But if I go back to the input, then if you think about this, uh, this three cross three area or five cross five area, the bottom pixel, when you computed that, it actually looked at a five cross five filter in a region which actually lies outside this five cross five area. So you can see it's kind of expanding, right? Because, because every time you're computing a value, you are, you are considering like a, a big neighborhood, which is size of the filter. And as you go deeper, that receptive field will grow bigger and bigger. And usually like uh, after a few layers, your receptive field is like, like the full image. Okay, so now if the receptive field is increasing, so then that's the reason in the mid level, you are trying to learn like these, maybe some complex structures, which are, which are not, not as simple as these uh, low level features. And the reason is because at this level, you are look looking, your receptive field is much bigger and you're looking at a bigger region, right? And that's why you have these structures. And as you go deeper, you have like more complicated structures and some of these are like the whole objects in itself. Professor? Yes. Um, so does, is that, like how does that get affected by different sizes of kernels? Would like, because I mean, I, I'm having a hard time imagining that. Right, right, right. That's a, that's a that's a very good question. So if your if a kernel size is small, let's say three cross three, then your receptive field will grow very slowly as you go deeper in your network. But if your recept if your kernel size is big, let's say five cross five, seven cross seven, or eleven cross eleven, then your receptive field will also grow like pretty fast. Okay, so that that that's what you were asking. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly what I was asking. And and that's why like it's a hyperparameter. You have to decide like what should be your filter size. It's not just about like what type of features you can learn in this layer. It will also influence like what kind of features you are going to learn in layers like which are uh, more deeper. Okay, so and then you once you have these like uh, complicated structures, then you can see that uh, it should be like easy to classify them. And that's what happens like in a CNN. Uh, quick question. Yes. So the higher level features, are they just like combinations of the lower level ones? So like, for example, the um, like the lines and the mid-level features are just made up of 
lines of low, the low level feature lines just kind of arranged and it kind of classifies that, hey, um, when we encounter this pattern of this feature, it's this mid-level feature. So like mm -hmm. they, they build on each other? Yeah, they are building on each other, that's right. Okay, so that's why it increases. I thought like the kernel size was increasing or something, but. No, no, kernel size is not increasing. And again, these are not the learned kernels. These are something, so these patterns are from the input image for which your kernel is actually giving a high response. So it's not very easy to visualize these things. So probably I should talk a bit more about that. So, and, and you're right, I mean the kernel size is not increasing. Kernel size might be staying the same, three cross three here, then three cross three, three cross three, all over the network, right? But still you will be able to detect like these low level, mid level, and high level features. So what, what, what's happening here is, so this pattern, so first of all, you can't visualize your kernels. All right, so if you think about this, if your kernel is three cross three, then it has a depth as well, right? So if your input volume is of depth 512, then your kernel kernel's actual shape is three cross three cross 512. So then how you will visualize that? There is no way, right? It will be 512 different, different matrices, 512, right? So you can't easily visualize that. So what we are visualizing here is, these are patterns from the input image, which are actually activating those kernels. So at this layer, if I apply a particular kernel and I get a very, very high response, then we backtrack to the input image and check the receptive field and then try to find out like what was the pattern. So it's, it's a very complicated process. It's not that trivial, but this is like something which can actually excite a kernel at this particular layer. Okay. So I so, hope it's more clear now. I think so. So I guess in which case, another way you could think about it is you could combine multiple like feature level layers into one like one like multi-dimensional or like feature layer, like to say that um yeah, because it's sort of just like detecting more complex features and then you're creating more complex filters that you can slide over and the patterns that you can recognize become more complex. So, mm -hmm. right. Okay. So it's like kind of like having a bigger kernel, but we're kind of making the bigger kernel from little smaller kernels, which are also made of smaller kernels. Right. Because that's kind of recursive, right? Like, am I on the right track intuition wise or? Yeah, right. I think you're in the right track. But but again, as I said, it's uh, it's not very easy to visualize. There are research papers uh, on this topic and people are still doing research how to do this uh, better. So don't worry too much if you don't have the clarity how to get these visualizations. But just try to understand the intuition that the later layers actually, which are deeper, try to learn like this uh, more complex structures and the structure like simplified as you... Uh, go like to the initial is, okay? So now this is an important aspect uh, when you design your CNN. And as I said earlier, we need to understand uh, when we are going from 32 to 28, how exactly that is happening, right? So in this case, uh, we are moving from 32 to 30. So that will depend upon actually the input resolution, which is 32 cross 32 and also your filter size. And there are a couple of other parameters which we are going to talk about. Okay, so let's say we have a input feature map seven cross seven and we have a filter three cross three. So this is the first location where we can apply. So this will give you one value. This is the second value, third value, fourth value, fifth value, that's it. So you can't, don't have like more locations uh, horizontally. And that's why you will only get five values or five columns, right? And similarly, you will only get five rows. And that is the reason when you have a feature map of seven cross seven, you apply filter three cross three, your output actually reduces from seven to five. So you don't have to worry about like, like how to get this mapping because you can easily uh, derive a formula for this, which is just like uh, your number of uh, columns in your input feature map. F is size of a filter and just add one. That will be size of your output feature map. All right. 
Now, there is a concept called stride. So ideally, we don't want to put the filter at every possible location because sometimes it might be redundant, right? In the neighboring locations, you might not get, get like, like any additional, uh, additional values. So it might just be repeating. So what we do is we use a stride. And stride is, uh, by default, it's one, which means that you put your filter at every possible location. Uh, so if you have a stride of two, which it means that you actually skip uh, one location in between. So something like this. So this is the first location. This will be the second location. So I skip the, the center one. Okay. So that's called stride. And again, these are some hyperparameters which you will have to know when you design your uh, networks. Again, not like a very complicated, pretty simple. So you can see that uh, this time when you have a stride of two, your feature map actually goes from seven to three. Okay. So you can see that uh, if you increase your stride, then you're kind of reducing the uh, volume which you are extracting for your, from your input feature map. Okay, so now you can update the formula we had in the last slide. So you just uh, put the stride at the bottom in the denominator, divide this uh, term. That will give you the size of your activation map. Okay, so then there is uh, one more uh, concept which is called padding. So before that, so let's say, and again, so not all parameters will be possible. For example, if you have a feature map of seven cross seven, and you want to use a stride of three. So then you can see that it's not possible, right? It's not fitting. So this is the first location. You skip two, and then you can't skip anymore. So then these are kind of leftover. So which means that a stride of three will not fit with a feature map of three cross three when you're using a filter of three cross three. So an easy way to uh, fix that is you use the formula which we had earlier. All right. So and you see that what's the size of your output feature map? If it's a fraction, not a perfect integer, it means that it will not fit. But if it's a perfect integer like this, five and three, then it will fit. Okay, so that's pretty simple. There should be no issue in that. Okay, so the, 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 the uh, another uh, important concept is padding. You might be using this a lot. And there are different kinds of paddings. Usually we just uh, do zero padding. So padding is something you you add some values like surrounding your feature map. All right, zero padding means you just put zeros. There are many other variants as well. You just copy over the neighboring values as well sometimes, or you take average or all those are different variations, but usually zero padding works perfectly fine. So zero padding, and then it's like how many columns you want to pad. In this case, this is padding of one. So zero padding of one. Okay, so one column here, one row here, one column, one row. So now let's uh, talk about like why we need this. The reason why we need padding is this allows you to put your kernel at all the locations in your input feature map. So earlier when you don't have padding, so this was your first starting position when you have a kernel of three cross three, right? And this will be your starting position when you have a kernel of five cross five. So you're kind of missing all these locations. So to avoid that, we add padding and now when, when you have padding, you can actually start from this location, which is the first location in your input feature map. Okay. So the other interesting thing is uh, using padding, you can actually keep your volumes consistent layer after layer. So the, you, you don't have to change the resolution. So, and that's uh, true because you are applying the filter at all the possible locations, right? So the output should always have the same shape as your input feature map. And now uh, you can update your formula to uh, include padding as well. So you just add this term to P over here where P is showing like what's the padding amount. And this is the updated, uh, updated equation. And you will see that uh, when you have a padding of one for a three cross three filter, then your padding, your output size will not change. So this you can also use to actually find out how much padding you should do. Because you always know the size of the input feature map, right? You always know the size of the filter and you know the stride. Then you can just make it equal to N, which is the shape of your input feature map. And that will give you the value of P. So that will tell you like what should be the 
padding required to make the size consistent or if you have any target size uh, that you want to change. All right, so those were uh, some important parameters uh, which you will, I think, uh, run into. The other interesting thing is pooling. And this is like same as subsampling. And the idea here is uh, to reduce the uh, to reduce the size of your feature map, right? So as you go deeper, you do that because uh, that uh, saves memory and there are some other aspects to uh, pooling as well. It helps in making your networks uh, position invariant or shift invariant, you can say. So let me try to explain that. So if, let me actually try to share the whiteboard. So is it, is the whiteboard visible? Can you see this? Yes, we yes, can see it. Okay, great. Thank you for confirming. So shift invariance or position invariance is something, let's say you have two different images and you have to detect a circle. Okay, so the first image circle was at this location. And in the second one, the circle is at this location. All right, so let's say your network knows uh, to detect circles when it's present at this location, right? So if the network can also detect circle at this location, which is kind of a shift location from the original one, then your network is shift invariant. It doesn't matter where your circle is located, it will always be able to detect it. All right, so that's the idea about shift invariance. Now let's try to understand how pooling helps in that. So what pooling does is, if you have four different values, so this is one kind of operation, you just take maybe average of these and put at one location, or you can just take, uh, so that's called average pooling, when you take average. Uh, you can have max pooling, where you just take the maximum number, whichever of these is the like the maximum. You can have median, uh, median pooling as well, which we never do actually. So max pooling is the most famous. So now what's happening is, if your, let's say if your circle is towards the left, then this value or this pixel location in your feature map gets highly active, right? And these will be pretty low. then since you're doing max pooling, or even if you're doing average pooling, so this will be highly active, right? So, and if it's, your response is not changing, so you will get the same result. Let's say your circle shifts, and then if it will shift, then what will happen is this position might get very highly active. This might be pretty low. But since you're doing max pooling, again, this, you will get this value as the final, uh, max pool value, right? So whenever you're getting high value at this location, you classify that as a circle. Now, if you look at this max pooling operation, it doesn't matter where, whether like this was active or this was active. The value of this uh, pixel was not changing, right? So this is kind of introducing shift invariance. And again, this is just one pixel, but if you think about like receptive field, how this will reflect back in the input image, then these values might be coming from like different locations in the input image, right? So that's the idea like how, uh, let me close this, okay. How this max pooling actually introduces uh, shift invariance. Now let's try to understand uh, how this operation works. As I said, you can have max pooling or you can have average pooling. That just defines the operation. But what essentially you are doing is if this is your input feature map. And again, max po pooling, you have some kind of filter size. So if it's two cross two, and again, you will have some kind of stride like you had in uh, CNN kernels. So the stride is used like where to put these filters and the shape will like how many values to cover. Right, so, yes. Uh, are you on slides or still on whiteboard? I'm on slides, are they not visible? No, uh, at least for me, I'm still on whiteboard. Okay, sorry. So thank oh, I, you for yeah, informing me. On whiteboard. Let me share again. 
How about now? Yes. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. So yeah. So what I'm saying is, like your kernels, max pooling operation also has like filters. So there will be some shape. In this case, it's two cross two, and you might have some kind of stride. We never use padding. So if the shape is two cross two, so you can put your filter at uh, this location, right? It's covering two cross two, like for these values, four of these values, and your stride is two. So the next filter location will be this. If the stride were one, then the next location would have been this, right? So those are just like similar things. You perform your condition. And then the output uh, for this particular operation will be, so from these values, you got a six, that's the maximum. From this, eight is the maximum, three is the maximum, and four is the maximum. And you can see that you reduce the, the volume size from a four cross four to just two cross two, okay? So that's how your pooling operation is done. And uh, this operation is actually done independently on each, uh, each channel of your activation map because uh, you don't have to combine those values, right? So there is no linear combination or anything. So you just perform on each channel and just club them together. So that will be your feature map. Right, so that's pooling. The other interesting concept is activation function. So if you remember earlier, I said like adding non-linearities to, uh, to your network. And activation function is something which does that. So we won't be going into too much detail, but let me, let me just uh, tell you why activation functions are required. There are many, many reasons for those. Non-linearity is one. But ideally what they do is they take the activation map and they squish them to like a, a, target, a target domain. All right. So ideally in, in convolution, it's unconstrained. You can get any value. Right? It could be pretty high, it could be pretty low, but then you want it to be constrained. Let's say you want it to be between zero and one. So for that kind of operation, you can use a activation function, which is called sigmoid. So it doesn't, uh, so this is the equation for sigmoid activation, and this is the plot. And you can see that the target value is always uh, between zero and one, all right? So if it's like, if it's highly negative, it will be again close to zero. If it's highly positive, it will be close to one. All right, and then we have 10H and which it, 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 it actually normalizes the values between a negative one and one, but the curve is almost similar. Then we have ReLU, which is actually uh, pretty fast to train for certain reasons, which I think uh, now is not the right time to talk about that but let's try to understand what this uh, activation function does. So everything which is negative, it will just make it zero and it will just preserve the positive values as it is. Okay. And, and the reason I said like it's easier to train is for training your networks, you have to compute derivatives and why and like how, don't worry about that just uh, take it, you need to compute derivatives and computing derivative for these is costly, but for ReLU, it's straightforward. It's, it's a straight line, right? So that is the reason. Dropout is, let me see, we have some time. So these concepts mean I'm introducing to you, I mean, of course, when they have a very, very uh, deeper meaning there are certain reasons why they are used. And of course, I mean, I can't cover all of that in just one lecture. So all of the ideas like I have talked about, I have tried to give you like brief overview of why they are used and how they are used. But of course, I mean, there is a deeper meaning to all of those. And the same is true with dropout why it's required. And uh, so you can just understand the basic of what we do is we randomly or stochastically switch off neurons in your in the network, right? And you can do that for fully connected neural networks. You can do, the, do that for CNNs as well. So this is kind of a regularization so that your network doesn't do some kind of hard learning or rote learning, right? We don't want the network to remember the input data. So that's the idea. Uh, if you don't understand, it's fine. 
the I think the main takeout for you will be there is a dropout. There is a thing called dropout which you use in your network. And what you do in that is you stochastically switch off the neurons or the the kernels in your in your network. All right. If you understand that, uh, I think that that will be enough. Okay. So yeah, these are the reasons. And again, these are uh, uh, will not be very easy to explain. Okay. And again, this is a this is another normalization technique, a uh, batch norm. So what it does is you take your input feature map and it makes the mean zero and the uh, standard deviation like goes to one. All right. And again, as I said, there are a lot of reasons like why, why we need batch norm. But some of uh, the reasons why you should be interested in is it will make your training faster. So if you have a very, very deep network, then you should use batch norm. Otherwise, uh, don't worry about this. So let me put it this way. So when you have a deeper network, then when you're training it, then you compute gradients, right? And again, don't worry why you compute gradients. You compute gradients and they flow back in your network. So when it's too deep, then your gradients, either, uh, either they will like uh, be close to zero, they will be killed or they will be very high, so they will explode. And that will happen only when you have deeper networks, like very, very deep. So then you need batch norm and this batch norm actually normalizes the activation functions and that's also normalizing your gradients. And therefore you need this uh, when you have uh, deeper networks. The other reason it uh, let your network trains faster. And the reason is since your uh, values are like within some range, they are not very high or very low. So then again, doing computation is pretty easy. And so this is one thing, learning rate, I mean, we haven't introduced learning rates, so we should not talk about this. Yeah. Professor? Just, yes, go ahead. Um, is, is this batch normalization like only done at the beginning? of putting the data into the, the network or with you know, this? Batch, the... batch normalization is not for your input data. Batch normalization is for your activations which are coming out of your layers. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, that was just clarifying. Mm -hmm. Wait, is this the step where like each epoch you have batch sizes and you just split the data set and just train it on each batch separately? Right, so you will train uh, on each batch separately, and it's called batch normalization because you normalize over that batch. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so, and this is just a plot like showing uh, how your batch normalization is helping. We should not be worried about that. So I wanted to cover some few things about training. So these things I will just skip. And again, this is just trying to visualize like how your activation maps are changing. So you can see that uh, this is, this is, these are actually the activation maps which you get in your intermediate layers, right? So you perform conv on this. These are outputs from different kernels. All right, and you can see that different kernels are giving you different activations. And this is like after applying ReLU activation. So you can see that most of the values are suppressed because they were negative, so completely black. And if you try to understand, so what this is trying to do is this kernel is trying to detect features which are maybe shadowy or something, right? Because below that car and then over here. So this kernel is, the first one is trying to detect shadow kind of texture then the second you can see it's pretty bright over here so it could be detecting maybe very shiny surface all right it's very highly active at this corner as well which is kind of shiny and so on and so forth so you can see that different kernels are actually detecting different kind of features from the same input image and then again this is the activation after the second set of convolution layers and these are after railway and so on and so forth Okay, so at the end, you can see that it's getting complicated. And finally, you have this uh, prediction, which tells you whether the car is present or not. So this is like a nice visualization to see. Now, uh, the next thing was, uh, 
the Alexit architecture. Probably let's take a five minutes break and I will have to quit right before four because I have another meeting. So Alexnet we will cover, that's good. Then I want to talk a bit about like how you train your networks because that's really interesting. So I will probably skip the uh, recurrent part. That should be fine. Uh, okay. Loss function. All right. So yeah, we will. Uh, I will try to cover until like how you train your network, how to comp why to compute gradients, and how it exactly works. Okay. So let's take a five minutes break, and I'll be right back.
All right, so let's resume. Uh, is everyone back? Yes. Okay, great. So okay, so the next important thing is the number of parameters of which you have in the network, right? because you can't create like arbitrary size networks. And you you'll have to limit like uh, it depends upon a lot of factors the first uh, important factor is like how complex is your problem or and a different like how complex is your data so for example if you are let's say performing some kind of classification task for videos that will be definitely more complex than images right because then you don't have just the appearance or the structure structural thing you also have like the temporal aspect, how those objects are actually deforming or maybe evolving over time. So the other thing is like, let's say if you have a digit image, which is just binary, maybe numbers from one to 10. So that should require like a very small network as compared to natural images, let's say images of objects, right? So those are different things which, which you have to consider when you are uh, designing your network. And uh, so it's important to understand like, what do you mean by network size? And a good, so there are two different uh, metrics how we define network size. The first is the number of parameters you have. Or let's say that's the most important. And of course, like that depends upon a lot of other factors like how many layers you have and how many kernels you have in each layer and what is the shape of those kernels. So these are some of the things. Okay, so uh, the other thing is, which is uh, really important is the floating point operation, which you're performing in your network, which is also called uh, G, G flops, like measured in that term. So that will tell you like how faster you can uh, train your networks. So that's like another, another metric. So we'll just focus on num like on number of parameters. So let's try to understand uh, what do you mean by parameter? Okay, so parameter is something which you're actually learning when you're training your network. For example, uh, let's say you have, a, you have an input image, right? And you have pixel values, so that's volume. So those are not parameters. That's your data, right? So that's data is flowing into your network and how it flows from layer to layer that will be decided by the parameters, which is uh, actually the kernels in your, in your network. So those kernels uh, are the parameters. We also call them weights, okay? So sometimes you will hear like uh, uh, network weights. So that's the same thing. And uh, so the other thing is, so net the network parameters are not the only thing which will define like how much memory you need in your GPUs. What kind of data you are using, that will also define like the memory consumption. Right, so it could be the case that you are using the same network, but you're changing your input size. So that will require a lot of memory because your data size has in, uh, increased and that data size will determine like what will be the size of the volumes inside your network when you move from volume to volume. Because to save that uh, volume, you need some memory, right? So that's, the, that, that's a different aspect. So now uh, let's focus on the parameters. So as I said, the parameters are like the kernels which you are learning. So if you if you if you have a three cross three kernel which has a depth of three, so that will require nine parameters. So three cross three and then three cross three. So nine parameters as a channel and then twenty seven parameters as a whole. Okay. So that's the number of parameters uh, for each kernel. And then depending upon how many kernels you have in each layer you can compute that. So we'll do that for this LXNet architecture. So don't worry about it if it was too fast for you. So we will uh, break it down layer by layer. So this is the LXNet architecture, that's the input. And as I said, this is a typo. And again, this is a figure from the paper. So it's not two to four, it's two to seven. So two to seven by two to seven by three, that's our input image. Then you have five convolution layers. So the first layer over here, the second, third, fourth, and fifth. All right, then you have three dense layers. And again, dense layers are same as fully connected layers. You can call them neural networks. You can call them MLP, all uh, the same things. So these three dense layers, 
and then you have output one uh, thousand dimensional feature vector. So that's the general structure. Okay. So the green ones are cone layers. Then you have max pooling in between. So you can see that how it's going from fifty five cross fifty five to twenty seven cross twenty seven. Okay. So then you have normalization. So we don't do normalization these days. I mean, you might find a batch normalization. That's fine. But this kind of normalization is not done. This was like a very initial structure. And then this FC6, FC7, FC8, these are the three uh, dense layers at the end. So let's uh, talk about this con one. So this con one has 11 cross 11 size filter. Okay, and the input was 227 cross 227 cross three. And you can see that the shape of the output volume, the depth is 96. And now you know that if it's 96, it means that you had 96 different kernels in your first layer. Okay, so 96 different kernels and the shape is 11 cross 11. All right, and you know that this is, I mean, you say it, uh, it's 11 cross 11, but actually it's 11 cross 11 cross three. And you're applying it as stride of four. So the first question is what will be the output size of the volume? And you know the uh, equation, just to use that. That will give you 55. So the output shape is 55 cross 55. Okay. The next question is how many parameters you have in this convolution layer? And that's the question uh, which you should be more interested in. So you can see that uh, you have 11 cross 11 kernels, then three is the depth and 96 such kernels. That gives you 35K. So in this con one, you have 35K different parameters. And of course, don't worry about this. You don't, you'll, you'll not have to do this like every time you design your network. Your framework, whichever framework you're using, it will automatically do it for you. But then you should understand like how this is being computed and you should have a rough idea that if you're using this size kernel on this particular volume, then what should be the uh, uh, size, size of the output volume and how many parameters you should expect, all right? Now, max pooling after this con layer, which was 55 cross 55 cross 99. So this was pooling layer and uh, we had three cross three filters. They were applied as stride of two. So the question is like how many parameters you have in this max pooling layer? So can, can any of you, anyone of you answer that? Am I audible? Huh? Okay, so no one. Let's see, so I think it's 55, I wanna say 55 minus, let's see, cause we're trying to find out how many parameters. So that would just be so think about how uh, max pooling operation is done, right? So do you really need parameters to perform max pooling? Oh, no. No, right? So for max pooling, there are no parameters. So the output size, again, you can compute using that same formula. So which will give you 27. So that's why you have 27 cross 27 here. And you will not have any parameters because max pooling is just picking the maximum value from the input feature map. And again, normalization, that's fine. You're just normalizing the value. So the shape will not change. And of course you won't have, uh, so for batch norm, you do have some parameters because, because you store that, uh, that variance and mean over time. Uh, but for this kind of normalization, you usually don't have any parameters. Okay, so you can run through the whole uh, uh, architecture of LXNet and uh, you will, you can easily compute like how many parameters each layer has. And you can see that they are increasing over time because we are increasing the number of filters. All right, so this one has 1.3 million. Now, one interesting thing here to note is the number of parameters in your fully connected layers. And this is something which I think most of the students ignore when they design their network. 
So this you will have to be very careful that most of the times all of your memory or all of your network weights are down here, right? Because this is like 4096, around 4K neurons, right? And then 4K neurons. So the number of parameters will be just multiply these two. So that will give you 16 million, all right? And this is 37 million because the number of neurons before this will be something like which you get after max pulling on this, which will be around, I think, 8,000 something. Okay, so this is something which you should uh, remember. And so any question before we uh, quickly try to cover this network training part? All right, good. I will take that as a no. So now the question is, it's fine, uh, convolution is doing all this operation, then the question is how do we train these networks? And by train, we mean like, we need to learn those kernels, okay? So the first thing is we should have a good estimate about how good our network is doing. And we do that using a loss function. So loss function will tell you whether your network is performing good or it's performing bad. And based on that, you actually train your network, uh, which is also called optimization. So if, uh, and the idea or the intuition is if your network is doing pretty bad, you need to adjust your weights in the network. It means your weights are not right. Mm -hmm. And if your network is doing pretty good, like close to good, then it means that, okay, you are close enough, your network weights are okay, but a slight modification might be required. So that's the intuition. And that's how we use like the loss function or the loss value to update our weights. So this is like a very general formulation of a loss function. So X will be your input, W is your network parameters, and F is like a function, which is your network. So if you pass the input and network weights into your network, you will get some kind of prediction. And what you do is you compare this prediction with this actual ground truth, YI. So if it's pretty close to YI, it's doing pretty well. If it's uh, far away from this YI, it's doing bad. And that's what this uh, loss function is going to determine. Okay, and there are different uh, ways how you can compute uh, this loss. So standard one is cross, cross entropy. So how it works is you have the ground truth, you have the prediction, and you just compute the log of this and multiply. And these are like for the negative samples. Okay, so I'm not going to go into detail like how this cross entropy works, but just uh, try to understand like this is the equation and how this is how you put everything together. Okay, so this will be the ground truth, this will be the predicted value. And again, this is the ground truth, this is the predicted value. So the idea is when your predicted value is close to your ground truth, then this should give a value close to zero. And if your ground truth is actually far away from your uh, predicted value, then this should give a very high value. All right. So that's the idea behind cross entropy. And again, you can have KL divergence, which is fine. And many other loss functions like mean squared loss, you can have, you can have just L1 norm, just compute the distance between them. And the, yes. The, yes. On, on that last slide, um, the the cross entropy that happens like as an average as it's being trained right so mm -hmm. it gets updated every every time that it gets trained but it's like an average of what's happened so far right yeah it's not so far it's uh so you compute this for like a batch so ideally you you yeah. have a training set let's say hundred thousand images so you don't use all of those images at once because they won't fit into memory so then what you do is you train in batches. Let's say you pick 16 samples at once. So you will pass 16 samples, compute the loss. So this N will be 16. So average over 16 samples, and then use that loss value to make the network update. And then the second okay. batch will come in. Okay, okay, cool. Okay. So some other concepts are like overfitting and underfitting. And the idea is, if you have too many parameters, then you might be just overfitting to your training data and the network might not perform well on testing data. And underfitting is you don't have enough parameters. 
and you don't have the capability to learn uh, on the on the data which is like too complex okay so the plot here i'm showing it's just a, a just a right fit the orange uh, square dots are like the training samples and the blue curve is something which the network has learned okay and this is again uh, the same set of training samples the same orange uh, boxes you can see and this curve here is like what the network learns and you can see that the network is trying to go through each and every sample very perfectly so this is kind of overfitting now what will happen is if you compute loss using uh, this function you will get a very high not a very high value but somewhat like a positive value right because most of these samples are far away from this curve so the loss value here will be much higher than the loss value here because in this one the curve is perfectly going through those classes so this is another reason loss is always not the right term to look into when you are trying to estimate how good a network is doing so because it might be just overfitting and what will happen is this will perform very poorly in test set so you can think about this let's say i have a testing sample which is at this location right which is kind of in this distribution but from this point of view it's like far away from this curve right but if you have a point here it will be right over this curve so in this one it's trying to learn the distribution in this one it's trying to just learn the every sample learn every sample which is not the right thing okay the other thing is underfitting so if you just fit it using a straight line then you can see that again this is not like the distribution we had now if you think about this like in terms of number of parameters so this is just a straight line you just need two parameters right to define a straight line and this is a curve maybe you need one more and to have this high order high order polynomial you might need maybe seven or eight different parameters right so this is just a visualization but this applies to your network as well Okay, so usually uh, we try to avoid overfitting and mm, we do that using regularization. And probably let me skip this. You don't have to worry about regularization because I don't think you will need this anyway. Either it will be there by default or... Uh, so the other things which we discussed like dropout and bash normalization, they are also used to avoid this regularization okay so that that's a nice connection here and dropout mean you can think about like if you're turning off the neurons stochastically then you're avoiding like your network to memorize your input data so that was the intuition there and so let me actually cover this so regularization is nothing but what it's, it's trying to do is it's trying to limit the it, it's trying to limit the value of the weights you are learning and the reason is if you have uh, kernels which have like very high weights, then they will influence like the output a lot, all right? And if you have weights which are very smaller, then they won't have any effect in the final output because at the end, it's just a function, right? You are doing linear combinations, doing multiplication, taking average. So having bigger values will also always influence like the output you're getting. So that's what we are trying to do here. We are trying to limit the value what our weights can have. So we're trying to minimize this value. And these are different ways like L1 norm, L2 norm, elastic net. So whatever formulation you want to use, all of them are just trying to reduce like the maximum value your weights can get. So now the idea is we want to optimize, uh, perform that optimization. We want to minimize that cost. And uh, the algorithm we use is gradient descent. So I will quickly cover this because this is really interesting. I really like this uh, formulation. All right. So when you're computing a loss, that's a function. So let's let's assume that it's just a 2D function and you can generalize that to high dimension. And this is our function. Now, when you are at a certain stage in your training, then you might have certain uh, weights, then that function will give you some values, right? let's say you are at this location so what you want to do is you want to minimize cost which means you want to go at this location all right so that's the minimum value now how will we go from here to here so what you can do is we can easily follow the gradients 
So we can compute gradient at this location. And depending upon the, psi, the sign of that gradient, if it's let's say negative, we, meet, we move towards the right. And as we keep moving, eventually we will reach here. Similarly, if we are at this location, we compute the gradient, it's positive. So we go towards left, keep going, keep going until we reach this point. And that's what gradient descent does. So you actually update the weights based on the gradients. Okay, so you compute the gradient and alpha is your learning rate, very important hyperparameter in your training. So learning rate tells you like what should be the step when we are moving forward. So if the learning rate is too high, you will take big steps, which is not good. If the learning rate is very small, then you will take very, very small steps and it will take a long time to reach here. So your learning rate should be optimized and then you will take these steps. So you have a negative sign here because you can see that this gradient will be negative. And when it's negative, you are going towards the right. So you are adding value, right? So you want this to be positive. That's the reason you have a negative sign here. So, and this is the current value and you add to it this gradient value, which is normalized by this learning rate. All right, and that's the reason we need to compute gradients. So you move in the direction of the gradient to update this weight based on the loss value. So that's the intuition, but again, it's not that simple when you train uh, your uh, network using SGD, but the intuition remains the same. And this is, I think, a pretty simple step. You divide your training set into validation, training, and testing. So training you use for training, validation to optimize the hyperparameters. And finally, testing is to test your model. So ideally, what will happen is if blue is the training curve, you can see it will go something like this, a loss value. So at this point, you can see that it's still going down, but for validation and testing, it's actually increasing, which means that this is the right point. And after this, it's just trying to overfit the training samples. So you don't have to consider this training into account. Just take the model until this point, which will be the best one, okay? And of course, when you train uh, using mini batches because you can't uh, fit like everything uh, into your memory. So this is the back propagation and uh, I'm really, really wanted to cover this, but I don't think we have time left. So all these are fine. We can, this is also fine. So yeah, these are the settings uh, which we use to train the LXNet. So the activation was used, uh, which was ReLU. Now you know what ReLU is. Dropout was 0.5. You know what dropout means. It means that all the neurons were like stochastically selected in these tense layers. Batch size was 128. You have an uh, like somewhat idea what batch size is. The optimizer was HGD, uh, which we just talked about. You can ignore momentum. Learning rate was 1E.2, which is like the step which your network or your weights will take like when it tries to go to the minima. And this decay is, uh, this, was, this was done manually, so we don't do this anymore, so you can ignore this. And this L2 weight decay is this uh, 5E minus 4, which you know what it is. It's like the regularization term, how much weight you want to use uh, for that regularization. Okay, so I hope you understand like some of these parameters, even if you understand two or three out of them, I think it will be pretty good. So this is just chain rule because uh, probably just leave it. it. will take some more time. And any, any questions you have, uh, I think I can answer a couple of them. So what is the difference between the valid and the test accuracy? So validation, ideally, again, it depends like uh, whether you have that uh, available or not. Validation is something which you can use and try to tune your hyperparameters. So hyperparameters like your learning rate, uh, like your batch size. So all those hyperparameters, you will get different performance uh, using different hyperparameters, right? So you can use that uh, validation set to optimize those but you should you should never look into the test set to do that okay okay so you basically want the rotation error to be as low as possible basically yeah you're right okay i see 
you should always look into the validation error. So yeah, uh, it's fine. I think uh, we we you will be here for a couple of months, right? So if you have any questions uh, in what we cover today, uh, feel free to uh, write me an email. I'm sure you should have my uh, email ID. If not, let me put it here. And so yeah, that's all I have. So I'll have to jump to another meeting. Sorry about that. So any any last minute, any question, anything you want to say? All right, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's end it here. Thanks, I'll Professor. You, have a good on one. Friday. Thank you so much. Yeah, have a good this one. Was really interesting. All right, great. Thank you. Bye. Until next time. Thank you.